Hello, everybody. Welcome to Writers Drinking Coffee. This is a podcast based on writers sitting around drinking coffee or quarantinis and talking about writing, publishing, and the whole creative process. We do not censor ourselves, so consider us PG-13. Your hosts today are Chaz and Karen Brenchley, and me, Jeannie Warner, and a special guest, Kevin Andrew Murphy. This is episode 51, Wild Cards Bonanza. Welcome, Ooh. Kevin. We are so delighted to have you to the coffee clutch. Great to be here. Um, I have only known you for a few years. I think I met you through uh, Kit Catherine Carr. But how long have you known Chaz and Karen and all of this? Ah, uh, see. Well, I've known Karen probably the longest. I was introduced to her by uh, Kit Catherine Carr years ago. And then I met Chaz through Karen, I think, around the time they got married. We've known each other at least 22 years, Kevin. At least. Yes. So yes, we've been... Yeah, we know each other's secrets. <laughs> yes. We we know, know, know a great deal of secrets, which we won't go into, but I've known Kit longer th- th- than you, but that's still a very, very long time. So how did you meet Kit? Um, let's see, I met Kit by going to Dundracon, I believe when I was 18, and I went to her uh, panel on how to write for Dragon Magazine, which ended up being my very first sale. As a matter of fact, then she gave me a lot of the straight dope, and um, we became, you know, I, I was actually glomming onto her husband's Howard's French fries after that, because, of course, I was going on the group college student thing, and I was too poor to eat at the con. And so first they gave me the French fries, and I think they later on bought me a burger and stuff. And then we didn't see each other at all until a world con where Kit was there promoting her first book, and I ran into him in the bar, and she, Kit was just sort of amazed that I recognized her. And then we hit, rekindled the friendship and have been hanging out ever since. So what what did she tell you? What was the great advice that got you into Dragon Magazine? Uh, pretty much just simply, you know, how to be a professional and write and stuff. I mean, honestly, my very first um, thing to uh, query letter to Dragon Magazine after my, well, actually, I will say there was first the uh, abortive one when I was like 16, where I sent the handwritten manuscript, they sent it back. Um, but then the next thing I like sent them a query letter. I forgot the SASE, but they sent it back to me anyway with the um, a list of articles I want to write. And it was like, we've already got this, not interested in this. Yes, yes, please write this. And so I wrote the article on wishes, which. Um, is still considered to be the gold standard for uh, gaming <clears throat> articles on wishes. Because I pretty much called, covered everything in first edition and then went through all of literature and folklore for, you know, here's how you go ahead and lawyer up your wishes and then have multiple tables for various other things. So it was like fun things to do with your, um, with your wishes and you know, people could use it for gaming. So it's like, you know, wishes depend out – you know, work, work differently depending on who is granting them. So do you have that on your link to, on your website? And do you have a website? Um, actually, yeah, that's still on my um, old KevinAndrewMurphy.com uh, website, which is badly, badly in need of updating, but does have at least, you know, the first 20 years of my career, but not the last 15. <laughs> ah, well, look there. There might be links up on the podcast afterwards. So Yes. So I, I was billing you in the Wild Cards Bonanza. You are a writer regularly and have been more than once for George R. R. Martin's Wild Cards series. How did you fall into that? Did you walk up like we had Dave Levine said? He just walked out and said, I want to write for Wild Cards. What's, what's your story? What's your Wild Card? Okay. Well, my Wild Card story... Um, it actually goes on that uh, Dragon Magazine article. It's the Dragon Magazine article um, when I was getting um, extra references because they wanted to have it expanded to cover other game systems. I ended up sending things to Bard Games, which did Talos Lanta, and Talos Lanta thought that I was actually wanting to write for them. So in addition to sending me their books, um, they got me in as part of the Talos Lanta crew, which was then 
run by one of the editors from Steve Jackson Games, uh, Bill Armentrout, and he ended up um, then getting me into, you know, the Steve Jackson Games listing, and I found out that Wild Cards, which I had read the book, you know, as a series was going on and wanted to write for it, but I had, was like only published in fanzines at that point. I was going, hmm, and found out found out that uh, they needed somebody to write the second Wild Cards game book, Aces Abroad. And so I ended up pitching for that. I was the only person called back after the first pitches. Um, and I got the gig. And so I wrote it up for Steve Jackson Games, um, wrangled things with my editor, Richard Meinhardt, so that I was not uh, giving away the farm because I actually wanted to get into Wild Cards. And this was my... Uh, devious plan, and what happened is that the manuscripts were put across George's desk for approval, and he fell in love with my characters and decided to jump me into the gang. And at first, he he was sort of hesitant about letting me, you know, do any writing. But I had I said one of the best prescient things I've said is that you know I would rather be bench warming in the the major leagues and batting in the minors. And George being a huge baseball fan, this was the right thing to say. And so I got in, um, I didn't get into the first book that I pitched for, which was Dealer's Choice, but my character, her and the Huntsman got on the cover. Um, but I got into Card Sharks, that was the book after that. So you're another one who's come through gaming GURPS into writing for GURPS rather than writing for GURPS and then getting involved with gaming in it? Yes. Yeah, my friend Craig had actually been a uh, big-time GURPS aficionado, so I was very familiar with the system. And um, though I'm in some ways very rules agnostic in that I will run games with whatever systems people are playing. I remember once in college, there was everybody talking about how their game was absolutely the best system ever. And I just said, okay, everybody, I want you to make up starting level characters from all these worlds and we're going to just simply run things and I will just sand off the, the funny bits and make it work. And says, well, but all of these have different magic systems. How will that work? And I said, wizards always argue about the true nature of magic. Therefore, you're all right. Uh, <laughs> that's what is good? What is GURPS? What? Yes, GURPS. Uh, it, GURPS stands for Generic Universal Role Playing System. Um, which is a funny acronym for actually a very good role-playing system. And, of course, I'll, I'll go ahead and tell the, the funny anecdote um, with the with the first edition of Group Supers, which was Group Superheroes, which Wild Cards was a supplement for, where they had the superhero book where it said, they said, here, we've made the absolute complete rules for everything that you could ever possibly want to have in superheroes, so you don't have to make up extra powers. I'm going like, no, I need to make up two extra powers to make this actually work. And then I argued to Steve Jackson. I said, um, there are definitely oversights in here because there is actually no rules for x-ray vision in the special vision powers. However, you have an illustration of somebody using x-ray vision, at which point Steve got very cranky at the other editors and immediately went into having um, I, I think, plans for GURPS Super 2nd Edition. <laughs> <laughs> so, uppity to the right people at the right times, that's what I'm getting? <laughs> yeah. yeah. You talk to the right people at the right times, you do, you do stuff, you, you know, and, and Esther Friesner, who's another editor I've worked for, says, you know, you know, you know, be professional, and if somebody says no, just say, you know, your lost goods and go on. But, you know, sometimes people say yes, and so that's a good thing. Yeah, that's what I've heard from other people, too. I think you've, you've hit right on it, which is be polite and be professional and accept mm -hmm. a no politely. So. I, I, I am collecting yes. a large collection of very friendly, well-phrased no's. So I think it's how we handle rejection that defines us as adults. And that really goes for writing, too, you know? <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, on top of that, sometimes also your rejections will end up turning into a uh, interesting acceptance. I'll actually go ahead with one of my wild card stories of one of my first sales. I got I sold to uh, Paul Salmon for 
the the king is dead tales of elvis post-mortem but it was originally titled die elvis die and i found out about this uh from sage walker who had been jumped into wild cards just after me and i had called her from world fantasy to basically welcome her to wild cards and talk about her character and we got to talk and everything and then she said well what are you working on aside from wild cards and i said well, I'm really wanting to do an Elvis is Stolen by the Elves anthology. I mean, sorry. And she said, oh, is that for Paul Salmon's anthology? And I said, no, what's that about? And she said, well, you know, it's a special imitation-only anthology that you're not supposed to know about. But I wasn't supposed to know about it either. But she mentioned that she had written an Elvis story to and sent it to a major editor who said, oh, well, you shouldn't say, I'm not going to buy this, but you should really send this on to Paul. And so I sent it to Paul, and it turned out that Paul didn't take Sage's story, but I ended up calling Paul after that, asking if I could write for the uh, story for the anthology, and he was sort of taken aback, like, where did you get my number? And I said, well, I just want to make sure you don't have any Elvises stolen by the Elvis stories. And he says, no, we don't have anything like that. And finally decided, oh, sure, he'd look at it. And um he loved it he adored it and it also fits the you know funny fairyland story which he was not in any of the other um things so i got to be in the same book with um nancy holder joyce carol oates and harlan ellison so it was a really nice um early sale how how does it work and this this may be we may have to get the lawyer back on but how does it work if you want to write about a recently dead real life human i mean are there any rights that you had to go through or get permission to say i'm writing an elvis story um no but that's i think because elvis it was such a public figure that you can go ahead and do an imaginary elvis figure a story just simply because it's all you know fictional i mean actually that was the same same anthology that had joe, joe lansdale's bubba hotep which they made the Bruce Campbell movie out of. I remember so, Bubba Hotep. <laughs> yes, and so, it, it, you know, it was a great anthology to be in, but I think that mostly went under, um, you know, he's dead, he's a public figure, and therefore he can't sue you. Yeah, it's not so much the public figure thing. He's dead. You can't libel the dead. It's not actually legally possible to libel the dead. Yeah. Um, so as soon as people die... It's a fair game. And if you actually go out and kill them, I mean, asking for a friend. Yeah, asking for a friend. I love your friends. <laughs> um, I believe there might be some kickback on the killing them area yeah, of this you know, hypothetical discussion. That's, there's a when lot. The agents are still working out. Yeah. 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 You can kill them and be prosecuted for it, but you can kill them and not be prosecuted for libeling them afterwards. And I would just like to say that writers drinking coffee is not in any way condoning killing anyone unless it is a fictional character in your own story. Absolutely. Oh, what? You are also encouraged to kill all the people you didn't like in effigy in your stories. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I yes. No, actually, I'll bring that around to wild cards is it wild cards um we introduced a character not in one of my stories that we believe introduced by um walter john williams who and the character is duncan towers who is a well-known real estate investor in new york and he has similar um initials to somebody else well Some, that's for reasons somebody we all um, know yes and, and so that. i got to actually uh, you used Duncan Towers in the story. I basically said to George and Melinda, I would really, really like to use him as my villain for a magpie story. And magpie is my, um, basically the very, very first ace, the person who had special ace powers, um, you know, back on the first, even before the first wild card day, because that's, that's actually a character that Howard Waldrop and set up as the mysterious first ape that we never saw again. We may and have. So we, I, created, I was going to say, wait, wait, right uh, there for we, a second. You brought up an excellent point. There may be people listening to it who have never read Wild Cards. Tell us the uh, basic premise of Wild Cards. Okay. Well, Howard Waldrop is a very good way uh, to start in because he wrote the very uh, 
first wild card story, which is 30 Minutes Over Broadway. And that chronicles Jet Boy, who's the, you know, World War II flying ace boy pilot who has his own comic book and everything. And he goes up against the villainous Nazi Dr. Todd. And oh, by the way, Dr. Todd has found this canister of alien virus, which it seems that it will kill people, mostly kill people horribly, unless it turns them into hideous monsters, freakish monsters. Um, and so he decided that he would go take his uh, Zeppelin over New York, or actually it was, I believe, a dirigible made out of weather balloons and so forth. But in any case, he took, was taking that over New York to release the virus, and Jet Boy went to stop it. And, well, everything crashed and went to hell as the virus canister exploded over the city. And it turns out that while nine out of 10 people who get infected with wildcard virus die horribly, and uh, and of the um, what, the 10 survivors, nine out of 10 are going to be horribly mutated and, you know, turned into, you know, anywhere from weird, weirdly disfigured, anything from your hair turns green to you turn into a 30 foot tall, three headed green pig. Ooh. You know, something, something ridiculous, but horrible. Ooh. And then, <laughs> yes. And, and then finally, the last 1% are people who get an actual useful, useful superpower. Um, and, and so what are, the, what are these, what are these the, called? What are these? The, the, the powers, they're called, they're called wild called powers. And no, the, people, the, the aces the, and the jokers. Well, okay. So I'm going to get to that. So anyway, the people who get the superpowers and no downside are called aces. Um, people who get hideously deformed are called jokers. Um, and then the people who just die, um, whether it's, you just fall over and die, or you melt into a puddle, or you turn into the, you know, green, giant green pig and then collapse of your own mass. These are all considered black queens. And then there's also a few other uh, small, smaller things. There's uh, a group that for a long while that we called Joker Aces, and we actually we still do, um, except that I got to write a story for Names Over Queens, which is our first British volume. But it's actually a companion piece to the first um, Wild Cards one. And Names Over Queens uh, deals with everything happening in the British Isles. And so the people who have, get deformed but also get a cool superpower, well, in the U.S. they're called Joker Aces. In Britain they decided that they were going to call them names. And we're actually then picking things up as we're going to use the word jacks um, in American parlance, but it's sort of like just coming in, you know, language moves around and shifts, so there's going to be checks. And then, of course, there's also one other last type of um, wild card who are deuces, and deuces are aces who have incredibly lame powers. Hmm. So I'm hearing moist from Dr. Horrible's blog would be then a deuce. Yes, yes, moist, yes. Moist would definitely be a deuce, or I, so like if you have the powers like I can shoot laser beams out of my eyes. They're not very powerful laser beams. I can entertain the cat. Maybe I can do <laughs> retinal damage if we lock eyes, but it's still no more powerful than having some laser pointers. Like, <laughs> uh, but then actually there's also, the, one of the other things is that while there are some people who have um, juice powers, there are actually a number of juices who are actually extremely deadly na aces, except they're nice people. Um, so you have somebody who ha has, you know, my only power is that I can kill flies. No, actually this person, their only power is that they can kill anything, but they're nice. So they're not going to use their death wish power to do anything more than as a bug zapper. I would like to set them loose on mosquitoes. I feel strongly about it. Yeah, they may use, do that too, but you, you see what I mean? It's like, you know, oh wow, you 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 know, your power is that you're you've got you're a fly swatter, uh huh, yeah, and I can swat any size fly, even you, but I'm not <laughs> doing it. So everyone thinks they're a juice when they're really an ace, but you know, they're being nice. <laughs> yeah, nice aces. That's oh, one of the things that I heard that it was a joke. It was an April Fool's thing. But it was the Wild Cards musical, and yes. and I, 
you are a very good poet. I happen to know this. And I would love it if you would write, you would write the score in the, or whatever, not score, the, the, libretto. the lyrics. Libretto. Wild card for a wild card musical. I think that would be wonderful. I think, I think you should talk George into that. Yeah. Well, I mean, I've already written um, at least, you know, one song for my character, uh, Roger Ravenstone's in the Joker Town Boy stories. It's been in uh, Jukes is Down and Mississippi Rolls. That's actually my story that won the Daryl Award. Um, so you get the full lyrics of uh, the Joker, Joker Town Blues in there, which is actually something that was mentioned in Wild Cards 1 as being one of the old standards, but, but we never actually got the lyrics. So I wrote the lyrics for that. Um, and actually, I think Shannon McGuire wrote up a drop blues uh, music version of that. So may actually get somebody singing, uh, you know, singing the lyrics, you know, my lyrics along with their music, you know, down the road. But you know, as for getting a full on musical, um, I have a feeling that once the TV show uh, gets off, we may you know, go back door into a musical by having a musical episode. You know, Once More so, With Feeling was very popular. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Is, there, is there news about the TV show? Um, pretty much, you know, anything that I kn- know that has not been announced, I'm not allowed to say. Uh, it, you know, every, everything is, you know, right now we've been given a good bit of money by Universal Cable Pictures and, you know, things are with Hulu. And, of course, we've got COVID right now, so, like, all productions are, you know, hey. shut down. Everything is in the great land of uncertainty. Mm-hmm. So... You know, I I really can't say anything. You know, beyond uh, that, you've got do all the hopes. I, 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 hopes. I mean, honestly, there ha- there hasn't been um, where you know where things would be filmed yet. But I was actually talking with Mike Bassett, where he said this. He's hoping that they could probably film in Albuquerque, you know, or Santa Fe or something like that. Because in Albuquerque, if they do things there, they could build all of Joker Town, and then after the, you know, filming stops, but hopefully, you know, years, it'll go on for years, it will be a, you know, tourist attraction, because there's some amazing stuff you could have there. Oh, that sounds like a great idea. <laughs> Plus, yeah. New Mexico has not been overused for, um, for TV shows and movies, and it's got some really interesting environment, especially toward the south. So, I mean, you could do some interesting things there. Oh, yeah. I mean, I think we, we've had some stories in Wild Cards that have actually gone on in New Mexico. We've had some in Los Angeles and everything. But really, I mean, honestly, what Albuquerque has going for it is what Hollywood has going for it is a whole lot of days with sunshine without a whole lot of rain and overcasts and things that you need to shoot around. Um, and so you can go ahead and you can build Joker Town, which is supposed to be the Bowery in New York City, without paying the Bowery in New York City shooting prices. Yeah. <laughs> so you, you can't tell us about the TV show. Tell us about, let's see, you did uh, then the Wildcard GURPS RP. You also got involved with one of my other favorite gaming systems, World of Darkness. You wrote about the mage and traditions. Was that also just oh, yeah. knowing the right people? Um, well, that was actually uh, Stuart Wick and I went all the way back to Talos Lantis. They were both writing for Talos Lantis at the same time. And then I'd written for his White Wolf magazine back when it was still a magazine. And actually I had a start to get chance to get in with uh, Vampire right at the ground floor if I'd been willing to move out uh, to Georgia. But that's a little bit of coulda, woulda, shoulda. I didn't. I like California. And so I stayed here. But we stayed in contact. And then... Um, after having my first wild card sale, I ended up actually asking uh, Sue if he would like me to possibly put together an anthology of vampire stories for him. And he says, well, you know, we're actually already in the process of doing that ourselves, but would you like to write a story for it? So I wrote a story actually called Mass Parade in it, in, you know, in the first volume. And then I wrote a story for Werewolf, which actually they they bought but they didn't publish because it, it was a bit too long and they kept it as a novella to publish and it's still never been published it's somewhere but heck i've been paid quite a bit of money for it and then i got to write uh with uh, jim moore uh for uh 
Truth Until Paradox, which was the first mage anthology. And I thought, well, let's do a sort of wild card thing and let's braid our stories around. And we got the permission to do that, or at least the editor, you know, thought we were crazy. But so I wrote Silver Nutmeg, Golden Pear, and he wrote Grim Reminders. And the two stories uh, braided around each other with my character, Penny Dreadful, who was actually Penelope Ann Briskowski. Um, and she was a young mage who pretty much awakened in the middle of the story. And then uh, Grim was uh, Jim's magic shop owner. And there's, he also used his character, Jody Blake, who's the villainous ancient witch who is basically, you know, going around looking like a sex kitten, even though she's probably 500 years old. And as Penny's comment is, wow, somebody's oil of Olay was certainly working well. Um, and I, I, I had, had fun playing with, with the trope where Penny later on gets into a magic duel with Jody and Jody is there saying, who do you think you are dealing with? And Penny's response was Bimbo Yaga, which really, you know, it, it, it's a really bad thing with, for an ancient witch when somebody has your number. Yeah. yeah. Are you... I was going to say, it seems like you've been guided through some of these things. So are you a pantser or a plotter? Do you, do you sit and outline what you're, what you're going to do? Or? I'm, I'm a little bit of both. I think that, you know, there's the pantser and the plotter, or um, as George, George R. Martin calls them, the gardeners and the architects. Um, and, and, you know, the architects are, are the plotters, the, you know, the uh, gardeners are the pantsers. But what I tend to do is I lay out an outline of where I want to go, and then I see what springs up within the outline. And sometimes things will, you know, go wildly off course, and sometimes you'll get something springing up that is, you know, really amazing. And then sometimes things will go exactly to plan. So um, my short answer is sort of depends, depends on the story. Um, mostly does it sell, you know, and does the editor, you know, like it or do they have a better idea? Because I've had stories like I've sold to George, which have pretty much been exactly as they, they were somewhere. He says, uh, drop the first act and, you know, we've got a sale. And then ones where I've had to do a complete rewrite on them, but the rewrite ended up with much better story. <laughs> What are you working on currently? Um, you mentioned you are an editor in chief these days. What's what's going on with it? Okay, well, editor in chief uh, is interesting. Um, I'm actually doing uh, some gaming stuff. I, I'm editor in chief for Savage Sign, which is the Savage Worlds uh, magazine, which has a whole bunch of different amazing uh, worlds, all set up as basically individual chapters in the magazine. And it's all done, you know, online PDF. So you can actually uh, go through drive through RPG and download, you know, for purchase, of course, uh, the first issue of Savage Side number one. And then the Kickstarter just started yesterday uh, for uh, Savage Sign uh, issue two. And there's a whole bunch of, uh, you know, interesting things. There's like, you know, the Islands of Terror, which is sort of like a, you know, 2,000 Leagues Under the Sea meets Cthulhu um, adventure setting. Um, and then there's, you know, the Isles of Fire, which is sort of like a Moana-type, you know, South Seas Pacific, Pacific uh, fantasy things. And so there's, you know, two, you know, two different, you know, ones there. Um, so there's one I was going to say, so let me back up and get, get crystal clarity here. This is... Okay. You guys are creating worlds that if DMs are want to run something but don't know where, you create a world for them, just sort of like, here you go, run loose with it? Right, yeah, it's, it's basically, it's, it's for the Savage Worlds um, role-playing system. The Savage Worlds is like GURPS or, you know, other systems where it's basically it's made to be a universal role-playing system. There's a lot of different uh, settings that go in Savage Worlds. Actually, I got the Savage Worlds by writing for Suzerain. Um, which is Miles Cantor's um, bit, series with it. And so I wrote a whole bunch of things with the Dungeon Land series. And then I ended up getting with Aaron Acevedo, who's one of the, who's the art director, but also the creator of Savage Design. And so 
I've written a, first wrote a bunch of fiction for um, one of the uh, super powered settings for Savage for Savage Sign Number One, and then I ended up, you know, being asked in. You know, it's like okay, you know, we honestly, what happened is that the editor in chief for Savage Sign One had to move on to being editor for the uh, new Deadlands revamp, so they needed somebody who could go ahead and do, you know, new no editing. Honestly, everyone's been a joy to work with. Are they ever looking for more? I mean, are they well, ever looking for... I'm sorry, go ahead, Karen. No, I was just... It sounds really interesting. I I'm, I may actually check this out and <laughs> follow the link that's going to be on the website. Oh, yeah. Well, and we'll put a thing for the Kickstarter, but for if, if there was somebody listening, they're like, oh, yeah, I totally want to write for that. Do they, do they reach out to you? Or what would somebody do if they wanted to query into that world? So wh- query into which world? Let's say they wanted to write for you. Um, yeah, pretty much it's it. They would just, you know, send me a query. I, I think we're, we're mostly full up, but we are also, you know, taking sub submissions. I'd say the easiest thing to do is, you know, download and read the first issue. And once you've done that, say, okay, I would like to, you know, write up this setting. And it, because also most of the settings are being written by their creators where, you know, like Eugene Marshall is one of the, the writers but it, and he's created it you know, his, his own world and, you know, everything is, you know, there. And so he's writing the, here's the world and then here's an adventure set in it. And then as people read things, they're going to say, okay, I'd like to see more of this world. I'd like, you know, I'd like to see more of that world. And there's just, you know, some amazing things. So there's, you know, there's the Islands of Fire one, as I said, it's going to be, be coming up. And um, uh, see, there, there's well, one yeah. where there's... Like, I was going to yeah. say, I, I, I want to leave some of it on the, the links up there. And mm-hmm. you have a new Kickstarter, so I'll put the Kickstarter link on there. But these are exactly the sorts of things that people could say, wow, I really want to do that. So it's really neat that you create an opportunity that other people can come forward and maybe figure out how to get their foot in the door of writing for a game, writing for a book, writing for a world, writing for a series or Maybe working with another author, if somebody wanted to take one of Chaz's works and say, I want to do the world of Desdemona in an RPG, Chaz, let's do it. So I love that there's like, an opportunity yeah. for that. Yeah, I like that idea. I think someone should should jump forward and, and do that. <laughs> yeah, because Chaz is too English to actually, you know, put himself forward like that because English and all. But... Like I said, we will put links to all of these, and uh, I may need you to go back over this with me, Kevin, and and so that I catch all of the writers and stories um, and interesting things we put on our website, which is www.writersdrinkingcoffee.com. You'll find us also on Facebook or Twitter. We love email. Uh, Kevin, if fans want to send you an email, uh, can I forward that to you and you'll help me respond? Yes. Fantastic. You've been listening to Writers Drinking Coffee, a labor of love and enthusiasm put together by the hosts. Our main web support magic is brought to you by Deirdre McGaffey Schween, and our sound engineer and backup web spider is David Welsh. Our intro music is Pretty Maid Milking a Cow, and our exit music is Breakfast with the Morning Person, both by Michael Ingberg. You can hear more from Michael Ingberg on manyhatsmusic.com. Our podcast sponsor is Eternally Jackal Designs, who enables you all to buy the cool WC... WDC swag that you can wear proudly across your chest. And hey, thanks so much for listening. <laughs>